and welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I am your host, Bob Pisani, but you probably knew that. It's been 10 years in the waiting, but crypto enthusiasts believe the SEC may finally be on the verge of approving a spot Bitcoin ETF, perhaps as soon as this week. There are 13 applicants for Bitcoin ETFs. First in line, Kathy Wood from ARK Invest. She joins us now, along with Jan Van Eck, CEO of Van Eck, who also has an application for a spot Bitcoin ETF in. Doug Jonas is the head of exchange-traded products here at the New York Stock Exchange. And Ophelia Snyder is the founder of 21 Shares. She's a partner with Kathy Wood launching ETF products. Uh, Kathy, uh, I was joking with this uh, about you earlier. It was the Winklevoss twins who first filed for the first Bitcoin ETF back in 2013. I think it was 2017 it took for the SEC to reject that and all the other ones. So do you believe your application is going to be improved? Why do you think so? And what kind of negotiations or discussions have you had about the SEC, with the SEC about this? Yes, well, uh, that's the important word, discussions. Uh, mostly questions and answers, uh, which was unlike uh, previous filings. So they started asking questions, uh, I think, of many of us, and uh, we provided answers. Uh, it became a process. The questions very uh, detailed, very technical, uh, which told us they were getting ready. Now, can we be 100% sure there will be a approval this week? No, you never say 100%, but uh, we're feeling really good about it. Jan, you've got an application as well. Kathy says she's been talking with the SEC. It seems like something's happening. What's your sense here? Um, I would just say in general what I read publicly is that, that uh, people go through this process of the SEC commenting on prospectuses. This is true for all ETFs, and that's what's happening now. So all the prep work that needs to happen is, is happening. But the fact that they're commenting, or at least asking questions, that's the right Not thing. Not just commenting. Yeah. Commenting on the specific yeah. prospectus, which is the disclosure document, which every public security But my point is, if they had some grand scheme to challenge this again, and some new novel legal theory, they wouldn't be going through all this. It's a positive sign, isn't it? There's always someone higher on the org chart, Bob. <laughs> so you, ne you never know when lightning might strike, but yes. All right. Uh, Doug, you're here because you're the industry guy. You represent the New York Stock Exchange. You're in charge of ETFs here at the NYSE. A, a spot Bitcoin ETF is a brand new product. Uh, there's been reports the exchanges have been in discussion with the SEC about the mechanics uh, of how this, might, this product might trade. What can you tell us about that and when it might trade? Yeah, I mean, look, as mentioned, we have been working on a potential spot Bitcoin ETF for the better part of 10 years. And this week is an exciting time. I think a lot of people are sort of gearing up and trying to read the tea leaves. At the end of the day, we won't speak for our regulator. The SEC has a series of approvals they need to make in order to make a spot Bitcoin ETF a reality. That being said, when we start to think about the tea leaves, right, what are we reading about? We're seeing a lot of communication both directions from issuers on the different filings, and we're seeing a lot of gearing up, right? We're starting to see the lead market makers being mm -hmm. chosen. We're seeing the filings happen with respect to expense ratios. So I think across the industry, we're seeing all the signs yeah. of a potential approval. And look, that's what we do here at the New York Stock Exchange. It is about innovation. It's what we've always done. And so we're really excited to be a part of this. So I don't want to get too wonky on this, but there's two components of this because it's a little more complicated. There's what's called a 19B4 filing. This is a form used by the exchanges to tell the SEC about a proposed rule change because we have a new product here, right? That's right. So that's, that's what right. you need there's to do. There's two pieces here. So right. And then there's the S1, which you all know about. That's the individual product registration. So that's right. It, would, explain this to us and, and what has to be approved first or what what's the process? Yeah, I wouldn't look at it as a first, second piece, but there's two components. One component is we want the ETF itself to become approved, and that's your S1 filing. That'll, that'll make the product itself viable and approved by the SEC. The other side is, look, this is an ETF that's innovative and unique. It's never traded here at the New York Stock Exchange, which means we do not yet have a series of listing rules to trade it. That's your 19B4 filing. So we're filing a set of rules that say for spot Bitcoin ETFs, here's how they trade. Now, we already have rules for futures-based right. spot uh, futures based Bitcoin ETFs. As you know, we have BitO. That's been trading over two years. There's $1.7 billion in BitO. But this would be spot Bitcoin, which is a little different. And all the exchanges are, are engaging in this. It's you, NASDAQ, and SIBO are all engaging. in the That's right. SEC yeah, it's the entire this. industry that's working on this right, right now. Uh, Ophelia, uh, 21 shares. You're partnering with Kathy for the Bitcoin application. Um, a lot of the old school wirehouses and wealth management platforms ha have not been allowing access to, to these Bitcoin products. Uh, I believe UBS, for example, is not allowing their advisors 
to buy spot Bitcoin ETFs. Is a spot Bitcoin ETF more likely to broaden the institutional participation? That seems to be the game, but I'm not sure that's going to happen necessarily. Your, your thoughts? The short answer is yes. Um, these are wrappers people understand. They're used to them. They fit within their existing infrastructure. And I think that's a really important piece. Um, I think futures product, well, they, they certainly have a place in the market, um, have typically been viewed as, as more complex in some respects. And so I think there's been a little bit more hesitancy there. Um, these are a bit more plain vanilla, or at least just as plain vanilla as they can get while still being in crypto. And I think that makes this a little bit easier. I think it also removes you know, assuming these things do move forward and get approved, it removes some of the regulatory uncertainty around these products. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, the role of advisors is to you know, manage their clients' money and, and provide them with access to high quality product. And I think, you know, taking some of that regulatory uncertainty out of the mix can certainly improve um, accessibility. Yeah. And you and Kathy are also launching recently a suite of Bitcoin and Ethereum futures ETFs as well, right? Yes, that's correct. All right, Kathy, um, let's go ahead. Do you want to say something? No, we, we think there's actually certainly room for both. And I think that might be where this ends up. I think we're going to end up seeing both types of products with, with different use cases for different um, user bases. And I think that's a big part of at least our ethos has always been to you know meet customers where they're at in their crypto journey. Um, so having that combination of both futures and spot product really puts us in a position to do that. And do you, do you think there's a, a customer for each one? Is there one a reason someone might want a futures? And you, Jan, jump in, any one of you, but uh, I'll ask you, Ophelia. Uh, why a customer want a futures product versus a spot product, necessarily? There's a variety of different reasons why that might be the case. I think spot products have a tendency to be um, a little a little simpler and have a more broad-based appeal. And that goes to you know your first question around why we think this is really a broadening moment in terms of access. But, you know, futures products um, also certainly have a role, and you see that in other commodity markets as well, especially around, um, you know, having significant liquidity, uh, potentially more sophisticated strategies that are interested in using futures. Uh, Kathy, so let's assume the SEC approves the application uh, this week or whatever. Uh, what kind of impact would a Bitcoin ETF have on Bitcoin. I mean, we all saw this big run up the minute BlackRock announced they were interested. It was 30,000 and then it went, oh, now it's over 40,000. It can't help but think this is logically in anticipation of a spot Bitcoin ETF. So is this a sell on the news event or not? Uh, I think a lot of people have been saying that it uh, probably will be a sell on the news event. Uh, but so many people are saying that now that I'm beginning to have doubts. We, we, we are seeing an anticipatory move, but you know, the, institute, the move of institutions into this new asset class, and that is what we are talking about here, a new asset class, which uh, with a, another diversifier, institutions can increase their returns per unit of risk because of the low correlations. I think that's going to be very appealing. And if institutions with trillions of dollars under management just put, uh, you know, 0.2 or 0.5 percent in, that could really move the needle. So we think the move has been anticipatory uh, and uh, um, and it makes sense. It makes sense. There's a, a scarcity value uh, now evolving. Uh, it's becoming a scarce asset at 19.5 million uh, Bitcoin outstanding. It can only go to 21 and 15 million uh, of those 19 and a half million are in what we would call strong hands. Uh, they haven't moved their Bitcoin in the last 155 days. You know, Jan, you're an old hand at this. There's, there's, what, there's a thing we call the S&P inclusion effect. When, when a stock is announced going into the S&P, it runs up going up to that. We ha this happened with Uber yeah. just a little while ago, and it happened in a, a, a very big way with, with uh, Elon Musk. Uh, and with Tesla. And you can't help but think there is such a thing as an inclusion effect. If all of a sudden there's a lot of people are anticipated buying a product, whether it's going into the S&P or whether it's becoming a Bitcoin ETF product, the product runs up. The, the, it, what happened was perfectly rational. So it, just riff on what Kathy was yeah, saying. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, I think Kathy's right that there is a short-term positioning in front of this approval. But yeah. what people are missing is just take a step back 
and you're in a great setup, I think, for investors who are going long Bitcoin. Number one, the Fed has stopped raising interest rates. So as a store of value, it and gold should benefit from that general positioning. And then for Bitcoin itself, the halvening, which is happening in April, right. has always technically been a positive for Bitcoin. So I think this is a big price impact event, but I also think there's there are other uh, trends that are happening, too, that are positive for Bitcoin. So I, I remember um, when Bitcoin futures uh, were launched in October of 2021, uh, they made quite a splash right at the time. The volumes were huge. Remember BITO? We had them on. There was huge volume at that time. I mean, that was a real liquidity yep, event. And right. I think that was a real, you know, Doug, way on this. So what kind of reception do you think the spot Bitcoin ETF is going to have? Yeah, is it going to be different? You bring up the futures uh, Bitcoin ETFs. I mean, they were the first time that investors had access via the ETF lens, right? And an ETF we can all access here at the New York Stock Exchange through our brokerage accounts. Uh, ultimately, that's what we're looking at when we think about ETFs. Uh, you know, ETFs provide democratized asset, uh, access to all these different investment vehicles, investment styles, and they do it all with, with ease. You know, what we're talking about today is the potential to now bring spot Bitcoin accessibility to individual investors, institutional investors, investors who may not feel comfortable investing outside of an exchange through a wallet or some other feature. And so the idea that you have a regulated investment vehicle like we have in the futures-based Bitcoin ETFs is, becomes exciting, and it's, it's why you know, we're gearing up here at the New York Stock Exchange to be ready to trade all the different vehicles that may come to market here in the next week. I, I think the day one, to, to answer your question, Bob, will be a big thing, but I think also it's going to be a process. Uh, the, whole, the whole book will not be written on day one. Uh, because there are a lot of investors that have been contacting us. Just how do we think about allocating to Bitcoin? And we're talking about financial advisors, fiduciaries, institutions that just, to Doug's point, did not want to uh, did not want the Bitcoin futures ETF. They really wanted a spot Bitcoin product. And so there are a lot of conversations that are going to happen. So I think it's going to take a while. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, you recently uh, sold some Coinbase stock. I mean, we usually consider Coinbase a proxy for Bitcoin. Uh, what's your thoughts on Bitcoin now? And we sort of just ignored the larger philosophical issues about for the broader investing community, whether this really is an asset class at all. Uh, and has, does it satisfy, does it have a significant use case, for example, something you would think of as a normal well, asset class? My starting class? point, Bob, just to butt in there. We're is, talking to a big bull here, okay, <laughs> and Jan Van Eck, everyone. There's some, look, we've been doing gold since 1968. Some investors just don't care about store of value investing. But if you do, my point is that Bitcoin is a complement to gold. And there have been other complements to gold, silver, platinum, palladium, over the decades. So this is just a complement. So start there and thinking about where to put it in your portfolio. Uh, Kathy or Ophelia, go ahead, either one of you. I'm going to weigh in on that. Use cases that are broadening I'll out. Just, yeah, I'll give uh, uh, props to 21 shares, uh, you know, where uh, they have launched 40 different uh, products, actually now 45 with the new uh, funds here in the U.S. Uh, and are enjoying uh, economies of scale uh, that we think this uh, spot Bitcoin ETF is uh, is only going to to increase. And so this is going to enable uh, us to serve institutions. Uh, and we do think that institutions are missing this uh, this asset class. It's been uh, evolving for the past 10 years, 10 plus years, and uh, they've had a lot of time to study it. Uh, we've certainly put research out there, 21 Shares has, all of us have. Uh, and I, I do believe, and stay tuned for our big ideas, but this idea that it is a new asset class will come clearly through as you see the correlation. Uh, a correlation of Bitcoin to other asset classes out there. Sorry, sorry, uh, Ophelia. Go ahead. O o Ophelia, you want to weigh in? Ultimately, this is a, a new form of technology, right? Not just a new asset class. So you can't really split those two pieces apart. And I think that's important here because I think, yes, over time, you'll start to see um, things like Bitcoin act more like that store of value. But right now, actually, at a technology level, it's still groundbreaking. And, you know, there's a lot of discussions around what, what blockchains mean in terms of their relationship with AI, what blockchains mean in terms of their relationship with global payments networks and monetary policy. This is still all 
quite groundbreaking. And if you look at you know where we are in terms of the adoption cycle, you can think of crypto and blockchain being roughly in the mid to late 90s in terms of where the internet was at the time. So there's still quite a ways to go um, in terms of how this actually will interact both with the world at large and, and sort of our economic systems, as well as quite frankly, how it will end up interacting with your portfolio. And so while yes, it, it has certain characteristics of the store value at this stage, it's also very much part of um, a new wave of disruptive technology. And that really can't be underestimated. You know, uh, well, I, I, go ahead, so Bob, Kathy. I was just gonna leverage off that and, and basically um, say that if you think about the internet early 1990s, what happened? It did not, the developers did not build in uh, anything to enable uh, financial services because they never thought it, it would be possible. This is simply completing that. Uh, and uh, we think that the efficiencies coming out of building that layer into the internet are going to be profound. Yeah, uh, you and I have had this discussion a long time. Uh, I am not convinced this is a completely new asset class in the way we traditionally think of asset classes, stocks, bonds, cash, commodities, real estate. But I am convinced Bitcoin as an ETF structure is a far safer way for people to own it than the current structure exists. We have all sorts of disasters, people forgetting their passwords, stuff getting stolen. So I am convinced uh, Bitcoin is a safer way to own it, despite my concerns and, uh, about whether it's a real asset class. Uh, and I remember what happened with gold. Now, gold's been, uh, gold has been money for thousands of years, uh, and it has satisfied use case, cases, clearly. Uh, in fact, it's used in jewelry. It's used for industrial purposes. It had, gold has clear use cases historically. And I saw what it did, the gold ETF did. You were involved in that, 2004 that happened. I was very involved trading it. Uh, we covered it the day it's happened down here. And I remember how important it was because people... Gold used to be like old guys in their basement holding gold coins. And all of a sudden, you didn't need to have that problem. You had a custodian in London that had a gold. I saw the vaults in London. It is eye popping. I saw the gold vaults. And you like, wow, they, there's guards everywhere. They don't the vaults where it is. It's safe. You could trade it on an intraday basis. And you don't have to worry somebody breaks into your basement. So this is why I think it works well for a, a, a Bitcoin ETF. And remember what happened to gold. I'm reminiscing with Jan here. It was like 400 bucks in 2004. It went to 1,000 in a, a few years. Yeah. Listen, I, I think it's very exciting for Bitcoin, this development. Gold, just to put in memory, when we launched our first uh, gold mining ETF in 1968, it was illegal to own gold. Yeah. Then in the 70s, they liberated the price. The only way you could buy gold is through futures contracts. Everyone had the Series 3. And then, the, absolutely, the ETF, the bullion ETF, was a breakthrough in accessibility and cost for investors. That's one thing, too, the spreads. Yeah. We were expecting, if there, anything like we see in Europe, will be much tighter than you can necessarily get on a crypto yeah. exchange. So I think that's it's really exciting. And, and Doug, of course, you pay for this. I'm talking about custodians. It's very important to have a custodian and not, you know, you're putting gold in your basement or eat or Bitcoin. That's, in, in that's some exactly right. Exchange. I mean, what we're talking and you pay about for here, that, though. But you, you do. But what you were talking about here is taking Bitcoin and putting it into a regulated investment vehicle. Right. And so there, there's a certain amount of uh, investors that are looking for an ETF that's traded specifically on in exchange. It gives you access. It gives you a vehicle you're comfortable with. Maybe it meets the mandates or rules of an institution. Uh, at the end of the day, though, it also brings other investors that have new and innovative ideas back into the marketplace. And we saw that, as, as Jan mentioned, with gold, all these combination complex vehicles, people trading gold in different ways. We're already starting to see it in the filings with, uh, with new and unique, interesting filings coming along, taking pieces of Bitcoin, taking pieces of some of these ETFs. So uh, the no, future I, is I exciting. I can smell the press releases coming in the next few months <laughs> from the New York Stock Exchange. While I, while I have you here, one of the developments that appears to have helped spot Bitcoin ETFs is the development of these surveillance sharing agreements proposed by the exchanges. Uh, Doug, briefly, without getting too wonky on this, explain how these agreements work. And, and this was a big point about selling this, how they can detect or address fraud and manipulation. Yeah, it was a big point. Market. I mean, this look, was the thing Gary Gensler really had a problem with. That's right. Uh, when ETFs list at the New York Stock Exchange and their underlying holdings trade elsewhere, 
the exchanges will set up these surveillance sharing agreements where regulatory departments <clears throat> will share data and will exchange data. But what does data. that mean? It sounds very fancy, but what actually happens? And uh, imagine how does you this help an, people yeah, protect Imagine people? you have an international ETF that's, that's holding, uh, it's listed and traded here at the New York Stock Exchange, but it's holding securities that are listed on uh, the London stock market, the LSE. It allows the London stock market, uh, these agreements, to share their data with our reg department to look for any fraudulent activity, any manipulation of share prices, and, and it, it sort of opens up the pathway for regulators to speak with one another. Now, in this case, uh, there was a lot of conversation about these surveillance sharing agreements along the way. At the end of the day, uh, that's sort of fallen out of the spotlight, I think, and, and most of us have been focused more on uh, the actual underlying trading of Bitcoin, how it's working at the CME and some of the other futures markets. Okay. Um, given uh, Kathy and Jan, I'm going to ask you, or, and Ophelia, you can weigh in. Uh, given how many applicants there are, we have 13 of them out there, there's a lot of interest in the fee structure here. Um, and some appear to be waiving fees for some time periods. Um, Kathy, I'll start with you, maybe on, I don't know if you published your fee structure yet, but if you can explain sort of what you're going to be charging here for this, uh, for, for Bitcoin ETFs. Sure. Uh, the, the fee structure, and I'll, I'll preface it by saying we are not looking to maximize profitability with uh, the spot uh, uh, ETF. Uh, we, will, we will do that more so with our actively managed ETFs, but we really believe this is an important moment for, uh, to help with the democratization of uh, Bitcoin access, giving more people access. So uh, that's our primary motive uh, to charge 25 basis points. Uh, and for the first billion dollars uh, uh, or first six months, uh, free access. Now, it, this changed, right? It was, it, did I, it, I saw it was published was 80 basis points. You, you refiled it with, with now 25 basis points, is that right? Yes. So originally, we were just putting in there a, a marker. We didn't know what, uh, uh, how, how uh, the industry was going to fall out. But as we were evolving our thinking, we were saying, wait a minute, this is a special moment uh, to, to make a statement that this is a public good, effectively, the equivalent of a, a financial superhighway, uh, a global monetary system, a technology, as uh, Ophelia was saying. And uh, we just wanted to make sure right. that one of the things we communicated is we want you to feel like you can access this. So uh, free for the first six months or $1 billion in AUM. So, so if I, I'm just a retail investor, I put $10,000 in your Bitcoin ETF, there's no fee for the first six months, is that right? Or uh, until AUM hits a uh, billion dollars, whichever happens first. Jan, have you filed the fees? Yeah, all the fees came out pretty much this morning, Bob, because they're all well, thank you. getting ready to basically <laughs> list on Thursday. Okay. Um, and so that's not been filtered out through all the news. Um, I don't want to talk about the specifics of ours. What I will say, though, I agree with Kathy that, you know, really we're standing on the shoulders of giants. And there are a lot of developers that have worked for free to build the Bitcoin network and continue to add, you know, to make changes to that network. And that we want to pay respect to those uh, developers. So we're giving part of our profits that we're making off of this ETF. But you did publish your numbers this morning, right? We did. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah it's, out th it's out there. And you don't want to tell us what it is? Oh, but, but, you know, Doug's compliance people are making me really nervous. Oh, brother, for crying out loud. <laughs> um, the, uh, but you think it'll, it will start trading on Thursday? Vanek products are competitively priced and very, <laughs> and very well built. <laughs> Reading like an advertisement. The, so you, but you believe it's going to start trading Thursday. That's yeah. okay. Um, Kathy uh, and and Jan, there are a lot of reports out there that, that some applicants uh, of the thirteen have lined up substantial investors. You want to give us any ideas? Um, any investors lined up? Anybody want to say anything? Some people have been the, public the seed about capital it. was disclosed in a lot of the S ones that were filed this morning, um, and. Uh, you know, I don't want to talk about our product too much, but we had very, we have very good seed capital coming into this. Kathy, Ophelia, anything? Yeah, I don't think seed capital will be an issue, Bob. Uh, and I agree with what Jan said uh, at the beginning, where, you know, for a lot of our clients, they have to now 
uh, do a little more due diligence uh, as as um, these uh, ETFs come out and uh, and and they see the S ones and so forth. So uh, we think it's going to be uh, uh, there'll be a nice push early on and then a good nice institutional build. Well, you heard we it's going to be out, you know saying. One of the things that is going to end up being incredibly important in the coming weeks and months as people start to actually do diligence on these products and, and try to begin adding them to portfolios and hopefully live up to these uh, expectations around AUM, it's going to end up coming down to how well built are these products, how well structured are these products, can they actually hold up to this? Um, you know, we, We've been running products like these for about five years, um, they are a little different um, in, a, in a bunch of different ways. Safety, security, operational infrastructure, it just fundamentally looks different. And I think one of the things that's going to be very interesting over the coming weeks and months is how that ends up translating um, with these audiences and, and with investors as they begin to actually come into the space for the first time and really understand the full range of that complexity. Well, there's certainly a lot of product out there, 13 of them. Is it your opinion that the consensus is they'll approve all of them at once? Is that a fair? Yes. That, well, we have precedent. That's what happened with Ethereum futures ETFs. They were all approved to launch on the same day. And I think the SEC, uh, at a high level, policy-wise, doesn't want to advantage any particular ETF issuer. So I think this is a fair way. Um, you know, of dealing with that. I don't think this is going to be a winner-take-all market, by the way. I think market share will be distributed. There'll be a lot of winners, and that's fine. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Well, it's going to be an interesting week, folks. You've heard the anticipation is building. It looks like something's going to happen. 13 of them will be here, of course, reporting on all of that. That does it for this week's ETF Edge. My thanks to Kathy, to Jan, to Doug, and to Ophelia. We've asked Jan to stick around and give us his observations on ETF trends in general for 2024. Coming up, that's the ETF Edge podcast. And remember, you can see all of our shows, all of them. This is our seventh year, etfedge.cnbc.com. Everybody, have a healthy, happy, and safe trading week. Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter. Your weekly update on the hottest trends, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Fasani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.